Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Adish Singla uh, from ETH Zurich. Um, talks a really interesting combination of AI, machine learning, and people. So um, I guess the one other interesting thing besides the content of the talk is uh, Adish is the academic grandchild of Carlos Gestrin. So let's give him a special, special warm welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dan, for the kind introduction. So in this talk, I would like to share my research efforts towards tackling societal challenges by engaging and empowering people. One such societal challenge that we face today is the congestion in urban transportation. The current traffic situation, especially in a typical North American city, is pretty grim. A commuter, on an average, spends about 34 hours in a year while being waiting and stuck in traffic. That amounts to 5 billion hours being wasted every year. Apart from big opportunity cost, there are, of course, adverse effects on environment and public health arising from traffic pollution and congestion. In the last 5 to 10 years, there has been a big push towards tackling this challenge, collectively termed as smart mobility. The goal is to reduce congestion in cities as well as develop new self-sustainable, greener, and cheaper modes of transportation. Today, we have mobility traces of millions of users we can make very accurate predictions about weather forecast and other major events. And we have the ability to interact with users in real time and provide personalized recommendations. So there is a hope we can improve this situation. One popular and emerging example of smart mobility, which has seen an exponential growth in the last few years, is bike sharing systems. Currently, there are about 1,000 cities around the world operating and serving close to 1 million bikes. One may wonder how well are we doing with respect to this new class of smart mobility system. Not as good as we would like them to be. This is a picture from New York City, a typical scenario, imbalanced scenario with empty and full stations. Any guess what you see in this highlighted box? It's a question for audience. So the general theme is that there is no place to park the bike there. Clo close to bike transfer. So what this, this is uh, the valet parking. So in New York, some of these stations are staffed with field members from City Bike who can take bikes from customers when they arrive at these full stations. So it's a temporary solution to tackle this imbalance problem. Or operators use these trucks to move the bikes around. This is a picture from the city of Mainz in Germany, where I've been working with a local public operator. So you have these trucks driving from station to station to move the bikes around. So ballet parking and trucks are a solution to this imbalance problem, but perhaps not as smart and self-sustainable as we hope these systems to be. In fact, these bike sharing systems typically face various operational challenges on a day-to-day -day basis, and we haven't really figured out the science on how to optimize their operations. In some cities, I guess including Seattle, operators have filed for bankruptcy and have been taken over by city governments as non-profit entities. So one may wonder what exactly is going wrong, given we have access to large-scale data sources and we can make very accurate predictions, allowing us to make near future as well as long-term planning. If we take a step back and think about classes of services like smart mobility, one thing is clear that people are becoming an integral part of computational systems, playing a pivotal role in their functionality, driving their overall growth, and deciding their eventual success or failure. However, when we tackle these real-world problems via using techniques from data science or machine learning, our approach is mostly limited to this classical paradigm of data collection, data cleaning, learning predictive models, and making decisions. So we often ignore the aspects of human participation, often treating end users as black box. And I believe we can do something better by building technology that works in coherence with end users and empowers and engages the people. My research focus has been on rethinking this classical paradigm, placing an emphasis on human participation. In context of services with data collection, how could we design privacy-aware algorithms so that people feel comfortable in sharing their data, especially in sensitive applications like healthcare? Or how could we incentivize users towards data sharing? In order to obtain better quality data, could we actually build behavioral models, especially when dealing with human-generated data? Or when using 
human label training data, for instance, image annotations in computer vision applications, could be actually educate users towards producing better quality annotations. How could we engage people in the decision making process to make the systems more self sustainable? And how could we enforce fairness as a constraint so that people can rely on the decisions we make on their behalf? In a nutshell, my research is focused on people, making them the first class citizens of this technological revolution. And I work towards this by developing new frameworks for machine learning and data science that engage and empower people. And my end goal is to enable new classes of services for the benefit of society. Let me give you a quick overview of my research. Let's begin by looking at this landscape of interaction between computational systems and their end users. Starting from traditional systems where users only served as endpoints, this landscape has been evolving rapidly in the last two decades. For instance, we have seen large number of online services like web search or e-commerce applications which have become part of our daily lives. Then there have been growing number of informational systems like Stack Overflow or Wikipedia, which are driven by content primarily contributed by people. Recently, we have seen marketplaces like Mechanical Turk or Upwork where workers or freelancers perform tasks in return for monetary incentives. While working at Bing Search for over three and a half years and collaborating closely with Microsoft Research, I've looked at research questions spanning different parts of the spectrum. This part of my research has mostly focused on large scale data science. I've been working dealing with online data of over 50 million users and petabytes of logs. And this part of my research, we have looked at developing new models of users of how they navigate the web and social networks and developing new techniques of personalization. In this talk, I would specifically focus on some of the recent efforts towards bridging the gap between this classical paradigm of machine learning and this quickly evolving landscape of real world systems. Let's begin by looking at community sensing and location based services, which are enabled by the exponential growth in the uses of smartphones and other handheld devices. Waze is one popular example that allows users to share real-time traffic information with each other in the community. In these applications, one of the key challenge is privacy concerns among users towards sharing their geolocation or other sensitive information. Towards this, my research focus has been on developing new privacy-aware algorithms for recruiting users for sensing and for data collection. Then I have been working in context of citizen science projects where people volunteer to help conduct scientific research. Consider, for instance, the eBird citizen science project where volunteers or participants take pictures of the birds, annotate them with name of species, and this data is then used by scientists for biodiversity monitoring. However, the data collected from these services is often noisy because of lack of expertise among participants. Towards this, my research focus has been on leveraging the power of human learning by teaching participants to produce more and better quality annotations. And working in context of applications with collaborative consumption of resources like shared mobility system and sharing economy, my research focus has been on engaging people in the decision making process. The key idea here is to incentivize users to explore alternate or less popular choices in order to make the systems more self sustainable. In this talk, I would specifically focus on the research theme of engaging people. And towards the end, I'll also briefly present a few results on the research theme of teaching and sensing. Coming back to this imbalance problem that we saw earlier, so our goal is to engage people in the bike sharing systems to reduce this imbalance and make the systems more self-sustainable. We often see some sort of imbalance in number of applications based on collaborative consumption of resources. This is a picture based on data from New York City Airbnb hosts. On the x-axis, you see three groups of hosts sorted in decreasing number of their review count. On the y-axis, the volume of requests received by these three, host, three groups. So what you see in this picture is that hosts with 20 plus reviews account for most of the activity. And this kind of captures this phenomenon of rich getting richer. Can be attributed to the fact that consumer choices are primarily driven by preferential responses. They would like to go to apartments which have already received high number of reviews in the past. However, since large number of apartments do not have any reviews, this creates a vicious circle, right? And our goal is to somehow break this vicious circle by engaging people. Similar challenges are also seen in other application domains. For instance, entry barriers faced by new restaurants 
exploring new travel routes in community services like Waze, or shaping the demand and supply of energy consumption to develop smart energy solutions. In the last few years, there has been a lot of interest in understanding the fundamental problem of how to do exploration when dealing with self-interested agents. Our work is inspired from this, somewhat complementary to this approach. The focus of our work is on learning user preferences across available choices. More concretely, our goal is to learn what's the user cost to switch from one choice to another. So knowledge about this pairwise switching cost could then be used to offer incentives to switch their choices. Let's get back to this problem of bike sharing system to formalize this problem. So our idea of engaging users is quite simple and looks something like this. Let's say there is a user who wants to drop off a bike at some station. And maybe there is a station nearby which is currently empty or about to get empty based on traffic forecast. So it would be really useful for the system if we could somehow incentivize this user to instead drop off bike at this empty station. And similarly, there is a user who wants to pick up a bike. There is a station close by which is currently full or near full. We would like this user to instead pick up bike from this full station. And of course, we would like to offer some incentives to users to compensate for their effort for this switching. So recently, there have been quite a bit of interest in trying to figure out incentives in shared mobility system. One incentive scheme, which is used in Bali bike sharing system in Paris, one of the largest one in the world. So they offer the following incentive scheme. When users are going to stations which are located at an elevation more than 60 meters above sea level or in outskirts of city, they get 15 extra minutes. So this is kind of an incentive to bring more bikes back to these stations, which usually get empty. Our work is inspired from this kind of incentive scheme. However, it's more adaptive and dynamic. So in our approach, in the system that we have built, we offer monetary incentives. So the money actually goes into accounts of users when they accept our offers, providing them immediate tangible reward. And we have an online learning algorithm which would learn what are the user preferences or the switching costs so we can make optimal incentive offers. Our offers are also dynamic in a sense that we take into account what is the current load in the system, so what would be the problematic stations in the near future where we want to make these kind of interventions. And our goal is to maximize the overall quality of service of the system. And one accepted notion is to minimize the proportion of no service events. That is, when user wants to pick up or drop off a bike, but was unable to do so because station was empty or full. So more formally, what we want to do is something as follows. Let's say there is a user who wants to pick up a bike at station I. And operator or the system would like this user to instead go to station J. Algorithm acting on behalf of the operator would make an incentive offer in form of a payment P. And we would assume that user has some private cost, CIJ, to make this switch from I to J. This private cost kind of captures user's opportunity cost or effort they would have to exert to make this move. So what we assume is that user would accept or reject our offer if this offer compensates for this private cost. Okay. So key ingredient here is that we want to learn this user's switching costs while interacting with them in an online fashion so that we can make of optimal use of the budget that we would have, for instance. And here what we would assume specifically is that these costs are sampled from some underlying distribution and we would like to learn that distribution while we interact with the users. On a side note, this kind of interaction with users is, called, or is, is also called posted price model. Here, algorithm makes an offer, user accepts or rejects this offer. This is in contrast to more well-studied bidding models where users are asked to bid of how much they would like to receive. So posted price model-based algorithms are more challenging in terms of learning because of the limited binary feedback that you receive. However, they are much easier to deploy in real-world settings. So the focus here is on learning posted price model-based algorithms. Also on a side note, the most of the results that I would present here would be on a non-personalized setting, where the goal would be to learn switching cost for a cohort or a population of users. And some of these results could be extended to personalized setting where you're thinking of user feature as a context. So in general, what we want to learn is this user's switching cost so we can make of, of optimal offers. And if there would be n choices in the system, let's say 1,000 stations, we would have to learn order n squared cost distribution for every possible switch. So this would have large number of learning instances and slow convergence. 
So as a simplifying assumption to bypass this large number of learning instances, let's make one assumption that naturally fits in the bike sharing system application. The specific assumption that we consider is as follows. So what we would assume is that operator would make this request to switch from I to J only to the nearby stations. So the station J is located within let's say one kilometer radius of I. Why this assumption is useful? Because what we can assume is that all switches from a user's perspective are somehow homogeneous. So what we would assume is one shared cost distribution for any switch that user has to make, irrespective of I or J. Let's see what we can get with this assumption and later on we'll try to lift this assumption and develop more advanced algorithm. Okay, so here, more formally, for any switch, what we assume is that user cost C is sampled from some unknown distribution. So we consider IID stochastic setting. And let's say the CDF of this distribution is denoted as F of C. Another way to think about this CDF is that if we make a particular offer P, F of P also represents the probability that user would accept this offer. This is just an equivalent view and we would use this view while designing the algorithm. So if we have no other constraint, we would just like to make very high offer as that maximizes the probability of acceptance. Right? However, there, natu there would naturally be some constraints and the two constraints that we would consider in this setting is first of all, we have a limited budget that we could spend and we have limited number of users M to interact with. If you have infinite budget or infinite number of users to spend uh, to interact with, the problem is more trivial. In fact, the, the way this system works that we have built is, is in some kind of time slots, let's say every six hours of time slots. So within each time slot, operator allocates us some additional budget, B1, B2, and so on. And within each time slot, we also have some estimate of the number of users we would interact with, denoted as M1, M2, and so on. This is based on the traffic forecast. Uh, so this assumption, um, so it's, the question is about what exactly was the assumption. So the specific assumption that we have here is that the user's cost to switch between any pair ij is identical. So we are not really considering is I, I to j or i to j dash. And the reason for that is because we are kind of thinking about stations which are located nearby. So later on we'll see how we could lift this assumption. And uh, especially for more complex settings like Airbnb application, this assumption actually doesn't make sense. So we'll, we'll, we'll lift this assumption. Okay, so within each time slot, our goal would be to interact with these users, make use of this budget, and maximize the number of these uh, offers or accepted offers. So let's see what we would have done if we would knew this underlying distribution, because that's something that we would like to learn while interacting with the users. So here, what you see in this plot is the utility or the number of accepted offers for a particular offered price P without any budget constraint. This is simply given by M times F of P. And the budget constraint is simply dictated by this red curve given by B upon P. So in this offline setting, if you knew this distribution under these constraints, a good benchmark price to offer is given by intersection of these curves. So this is what we denote as P star. Okay. So this is the price that we would like to compete with. However, the challenge here would be that we would like to learn this distribution in an online setting while interacting with the users. Okay? So what we would like to do is interact with the users in an online setting, make offers, receive their decisions, and then hopefully we can learn something about P star and able to compete with P star. So what does it mean to learn this distribution? So we could experiment with different prices. So if you offer a particular price, let's say one euro, we could offer it to a bunch of users and see how many users accept or reject it. That would give us some mean estimate as well as some kind of confidence intervals. And if we offer this price to more number of users, our confidence intervals would shrink. And similarly, we could go on and experiment with different prices to get some kind of mean estimate of this underlying distribution as well as some kind of upper and lower confidence bounds. So here, this problem has some similarities to the multi arm bandit setting because you could think about different prices as some kind of actions or arms that you want to play. The key difference here is that these arms have some kind of structure because they are kind of, uh, these are prices. So the, if, if you offer a higher price or take higher action, the probability of acceptance is higher. Another key difference here is this budget constraint, which is normally not present in the standard multi arm bandit formulation. 
So here this naturally leads to this exploration exploitation dilemma as in multi armed bandits because you would like to explore prices for which you have high uncertainty. At the same time you want to exploit prices which have done good in the past. The key challenge is that you want to do this exploration exploitation dilemma under this budget constraint. Is a question there? want to choose the intersection point rather than maximizing the sum of the two utility curves. So here the question is what is a single price that we could compete with? So in an online setting the hope is that you could actually compete with only one single price. So that's a common paradigm if you think about multi on bandit. So here what we are thinking is what is the offline single price that you could have compete with, would like to compete with and that's this P star. And this price has some very nice properties. So this is actually only a two factor away from the best you could have hoped for if you knew every possible cost of user. So if you knew users private cost and you could just make them that particular offer, this P star is only two factor away from that untruthful way of offering these prices. Okay. So here, um, now one way to resolve this exploration exploitation dilemma is to use these ideas from uh, idea of optimistic estimates. So here what we can use is upper confidence bound as an optimistic estimate of this underlying distribution F, dissect that with this budget constraint curve and offer that price. So that's, the algorithm, that's our algorithm BPUCV which basically stands for budgeted procurement using upper confidence bound. And turns out that this simple algorithm has some very nice theoretical properties for this problem setting. So here, the way to analyze the performance of this algorithm is what we call regret. So regret is essentially what is the utility of your algorithm compared to an offline benchmark, which is P star in this case. Okay. And of course you would like to have as low regret as possible. So what we can show is that the regret of this algorithm can be bounded as follows. And I'm sorry, this is simple regret or cumulative regret? So this is cumulative regret, not the simple regret. So here, uh, at a high level, this regret could be bounded in two different quantities. So one is the regret coming from rejected offers, where you are making offers which are small. So here you are essentially losing your opportunity to hire or recruit a user, because you have a limited pool size. And the, the second part of the regret is coming from overpayments, because you make prices which are more than P star, so essentially your budget could exhaust quickly. More importantly, this regret only grows logarithmically in terms of the problem size B or M. So the average regret is zero, goes to zero. And this kind of captures this idea of no regret guarantees of an online algorithm, which means you're able to learn and perform as good as the offline benchmark. So that's a bit about the theoretical results of this algorithm. Let's see how well does this perform in real world setting. So let me tell you a bit about the architecture of the system that we have been developing. So to begin with, it has this hardware component, which is the rental stations and the bikes. So that's managed by MVZ MineRad public operator in the city of Mainz in Germany. Then we have a virtual infrastructure, which essentially keep tracks of user accounts, make forecast about the traffic, as well as keeps tracks of status of bikes and uh, stations. This is managed by ETH spin of electric field based in Zurich. What we have been developing on top of that is this incentive scheme which would basically decide what are the problematic stations in the system where you want to make these interventions. It has this pricing algorithm, BPUCB, and it has APIs to interact with or communicate with the rest of the infrastructure. Then we have a smartphone app through which we would actually interact with users in real time. So this app would allow users to see what are the nearby stations and what are the stations where they could get this incentive offers that they could click to accept the offer. So let me present first some of the simulation results of this system. In fact, we have done very extensive simulations where we built a complete bike sharing simulator using nice data set from Boston Hubbay, which is a publicly available data set. So this data set contains complete rental history of half a million renters through which you could simulate the dynamics of a real world bike sharing system. On top of that, we implemented truck repositioning policy. That's kind of the benchmark, the current state of the art solution that various operators use. Now to actually simulate of how users would respond to our incentives, we did a survey study in the city of Mainz in Germany, so we could use, elicit their cost and use that in the simulator. So the first question that we would like to answer from the simulations is, 
how well does our pricing algorithm compare to some static pricing policies without any learning? So what you see in this plot is on the x-axis is the budget allocated to different pricing policies. On the y-axis is this quality of service metric that I mentioned earlier. So here, uh, mean is one basic pricing policy which simply offers a minimal possible price. This is simply 10 cents in this case. And what you see is that it quickly saturates because there are not enough number of users willing to accept this price. Mean is a very popular uh, rule of thumb kind of policy which basically just computes the mean of costs of pop users and offers that price. The reason it doesn't work so well here is because it still ignores the constraints of budget and M. So M could be really changing depending on the user load, and that's something which is ignored by these policies. And as we can see here is uh, our pricing policy, BPUCV is able to really outperform these two, especially in the regime of low budget, which is an important regime for operators. The second question that we would like to answer is, how should operator reason about allocating budget across trucks or incentives? So on the x-axis, what you see is the proportion of budget allocated to trucks and incentives. On the left extreme, all budget goes to trucks. On the right extreme, all budget goes to incentives. And what this kind of shows is really that trucks and incentives are really complementary to each other. And there are good reasons for that, because truck-based repositioning is something that is well advanced and is more at a macro level. Incentive repositioning is more micro level because it takes into account the current demand and supply of the system. Next, I'd like to show some deployment results. So these are more qualitative results, not quantitative of how much we are able to improve yet. So this is based on a 30 days deployment in the city of Mainz in Germany. And this deployment is for a pickup scenario only. It's much more challenging for the drop off scenario and I, I'll be happy to discuss that uh, why. Um, so first of all, let's look at the spatial distribution of accepted offers. What you see in this map is a city of Mainz in Germany. Each circle here represents a station, and the radius of circle represents a number of offers accepted at that station. So here, as we would expect, a lot of activity going in the city center area, however, some offers were also accepted far away areas. This is the temporal distribution of accepted offers. What you see on the x-axis is the hour of the day, 8 in the morning, 9 in the morning, and so on. On the y-axis is the volume of offers accepted in that hour, aggregated over 30 days. A bit of a surprise, there were also offers accepted late midnight and early morning. What is more important in this plot is this peak around 10 in the morning and for 3 p.m. This is a very important time because there is a lot of imbalance in the system around those times and it's actually difficult to do drug-based repositioning because of congestion in inner parts of the city. So what this kind of shows is that there is a lot of potential to have incentives effective in real-world setting. Finally, I would like to show this plot of what was the probability of accepting our offer based on how much we ask users to walk. So what you see here is on the x-axis is the walking distance from I to J, y-axis the number proportion of offers accepted for that. So what this shows is that hardly any offers were accepted when users were asked to walk more than 700 meters. This can also be attributed to the fact of this shared distribution assumption, because ideally you would like to have incentives scaled with the amount of walking distance. A few ongoing efforts in this space that I would like to point out. So we have been working extensively in the last few years with these uh, different public operators and spin-off from ETH, so we're planning a larger scale deployment right now with, in bike sharing and car sharing service in Switzerland and Germany. I've been also working on research questions related to a deployment of a new stationless free floating system. So these are electric scooters which are getting deployed in Barcelona in Spain. These scooters have a GPS trackers. Users can locate these scooters through their mobile apps and drive and drop it anywhere in the city or in some uh, predefined region. This leads to a lot of challenging questions compared to a station-based system because now you have to reason about how system would evolve through over the day. Then other interesting questions here are to, on the long-term planning. You know, where should operator install the next five stations or what stations are redundant in the system? And how could you apply machine learning and optimization techniques to learn from what other operators have done in the rest of the world? So that's some of the efforts and results in the space of shared mobility system in order to make these systems more self-sustainable. 
let's get back to this algorithmic question of learning pairwise switching cost that we started with. So, so far we made this simplifying assumption that let's consider one shared distribution because we are asking users to switch to nearby stations. Right? So, the shared distribution assumption is clearly restrictive in a number of application domains, even in bike sharing systems. So the walking distance for a user, the, the opportunity, uh, that effort would clearly depend whether station is uphill or downhill, as well as on the actual walking distance. In more complex application domains like restaurant recommendation service, the switching cost would clearly depend on whether restaurants have the same cuisine type as well as other latent features. And switching costs are not even symmetric. If you think about Airbnb marketplace, the cost of switching from a highly reviewed apartment to unreviewed apartment could be much higher compared to switching from J to I. So the question we want to ask is, you know, what is a natural structure or what structural assumption we could consider that is not as restrictive as shared setting, but still allows us to get some learning performance compared to an independent learning setting. So the kind of structural setting that we have been thinking about is as follows. So let's consider two choices, I to J. And let's say the user switching cost from I to J is given by CIJ. Now let's say there is another choice K. Then what we assume is that this pairwise switching costs satisfy this triangle inequality. Okay. So if in the bike sharing system, if you think about switching cost depends on the walking distance, then this assumption is reasonable. But of course, in many, some applications, the switching cost might not be sub-additive. Okay. So we'll see in some of some of the results that whether this makes sense or not. So I'll show some results later on on the Airbnb application setting. The next assumption that we consider is that switching costs are non-negative. And the reason for this is because we assume that I is the default choice of user. So it's always a non-negative switching cost to switch to another choice. In fact, these two constraints define what is called hemimetrics. So hemimetric is a relaxed notion of a metric satisfying only triangle inequality and non-negativity. Or in other words, metrics are a restricted version of hemimetrics which also satisfy symmetry and identity. Uh, why do you assume that you know where the user is really intends to go? Because maybe I could solicit a, a, a payment by pretending to go to another station and, yeah. and actually really want to go to the station you're going to send me to. Yeah, so, so the question is, uh, you know, should we really, should we assume the knowledge about I or not? And this kind of, I mean, in, right? Yeah, so this was the comment I made earlier that pickup scenario is much easier than drop off scenario. So in the bike sharing system, what we assume is that we could somehow infer I uh, as a proxy of the current geolocation, which comes from the smartphone. Whereas for the drop off, you could think about a lot of strategic behaviors that users may want to play because they essentially say I would drop off there, but they could actually play around. And so this is a very important question. I think it depends on the application setting. On Airbnb, maybe you could allow a user to first pick I. Once user is already through the transaction, at the very end, you kind of make this intervention. Okay, so uh, there's been a lot of recent work in trying to learn low dimensional metric embeddings of choices in the user preference space. So the key challenge here is that in these metric embeddings, the distances that you recover from these metric embeddings are usually, are, are basically symmetric, and they do not have any quantitative or economic interpretation. So the, the key difference of our work is that we don't assume any symmetry, so we essentially try to learn hemimetric uh, costs, and the way we do this is via this posture price squares. Just an alternate view to think about the structural constraints. You could think about this as some kind of regularization over user preferences, where you have on the one extreme is the shared setting. You want to learn one parameter for all the possible pairs. On the other extreme is this independent learning setting that you could think about as learning in a hypercube. And metrics and hemimetrics interpolate this space. So now the natural question is, does hemimetric structure leads to some improvement in terms of learning? So what we show is that there is a potential to exploit hemimetric structure in settings where underlying choices have some kind of commonalities. In a very specific setting where these choices belong to some few small number of clusters, the sample complexity of learning hemimetrics would reduce from order n squared to order n. So the problem would behave as there are only order n or small number of problem instances. 
So without going into the algorithmic details here, let me present some experimental results of using this hemimetric structure. So this is um, uh, experimental study using Airbnb data. So the way we set it up is in some kind of a survey study. So we recruited 500 participants from a crowdsourcing platform, and we took 20 apartments from New York City Airbnb. So these apartments look something like this. So what you see on the right side is basically these 20 apartments spread across Manhattan and Brooklyn, a mix of unreviewed and highly reviewed apartments. So the survey study goes as follows. So we build a web application using these 20 apartments. A user would come to our uh, service, would basically choose apartment I from out of these 20. Then we would ask user to switch to an apartment J, which is picked randomly from one of the unreviewed apartment. And then the algorithm would make an offer P uh, as an incentive offer for this user to switch. So this is more like a mock-up. So this is not something really happening. So this is something to keep in mind. Um, and then what we would assume is that the utility of the algorithm is given by V minus P if user successfully switches from I to J. So what is V here? V is essentially the utility of the marketplace for getting a review for unreviewed apartment. And we use V equal to $40 in our setting based on what Airbnb has done in the past in terms of referral discounts. So what you see in this plot is basically on the x-axis is these interactions with these 500 participants. On the y-axis is the total utility of the algorithm. So here as a baseline is this independent learning setting where you would treat every pair ij independently. And hemimetric is basically where you would enforce this hemimetric structure on this learning algorithm. Just an alternate view to think about this, this is you could look at average utility, and you could see that by enforcing hemimetric structure, the algorithm is able to converge much more quickly compared to independent setting. Is this in simulation? Or are you running this? Um, so this is basically running on, running on 500 participants, but this is a survey study. So they are not actually switching from I to J. So, so what do they? So you just ask them, would they switch? Or would yes. So we ask them whether to switch. So we tell them it's kind of a research study. They would basically have the description of what we are doing. So they would pick I. Then we would pick randomly a J. Then algorithm would make an offer P that they would say yes or no. So do, to do something more realistic here would need some kind of collaboration with Airbnb. So it's kind of a mock-up uh, survey study with participants. So the key idea of this experiment was also actually for us to check whether hemimetric structure assumption would make sense or not. So here, this is the data coming from real users, whereas if you would just run some simulations, then it would really, we could always enforce it to satisfy. And what you kind of also see is that this kind of non-monotone behavior of the algorithm, because the structure is not always the assumptions are not always valid in terms of user responses. So ideally, you should see the utility always increasing, but this is not happening in this case in terms of average utility. So just a few ongoing efforts in, in this, uh, later to this. We have been uh, working on these ideas toward exploring under-reviewed restaurants in, Z in Zurich by providing discount coupons. So for this, we have built this smartphone application, plan to do a user study. And good thing about this is that this we could do outside Airbnb, so we have a full control of the system. We can actually do larger scale studies in a more realistic setting. So that's some of the results and efforts in the space of engaging people in the decision-making process towards making these systems more self-sustainable or improve their efficiency. Next, I'll give, try, uh, like to give you a quick overview of my research in the space of teaching and sensing as well as discuss a few directions for future work. This line of work is inspired from citizen science projects for biodiversity monitoring. Birds are an excellent indicator of biodiversity and health of ecosystem. As of now, 6% of bird species are functionally extinct, and this number could increase to 25% by end of this century if no serious action is taken. You may have heard about eBird, which is a very um, popular citizen science project with about 300,000 participants worldwide to tackle this challenge. These participants take pictures of the birds, annotate them with name of species, and this data is then used by scientists for tracking endangered species and for biodiversity monitoring. However, the data collected from these services is often noisy, as I mentioned earlier, because of lack of expertise among participants. And 
As the quality of annotated data is of crucial importance, this problem has been studied extensively. A common approach in existing literature is to use some kind of aggregation algorithm, simplest one being majority botting to reduce noise or some control measures are used to filter out bad responses. Here we explore a novel and completely orthogonal direction of research. The question we ask is, could you actually teach participants in order to improve their label accuracy? So more concretely here, the task is to identify whether an image contains endangered woodpecker or not. So it's a binary image classification task. The question is, how would you select a small set of examples to show to the learners to teach them classification rules as quickly as possible? So what does it mean? What is the right way to optimally select these examples? Well, it would critically depend on what we assume about the learner. So what is the model of learner as considered by teacher? In a classical approach, the learner is assumed to be noise free. So here, if you show us certain set of examples to learners, they would quickly eliminate the hypotheses which are inconsistent with those examples. And in this case, the optimal teaching is related to this complexity measure known as teaching dimension of hypothesis class. However, what we showed with our user studies is that this classical approach actually tends to perform quite bad in real world setting on human learners because it picks examples which are confusing and difficult, kind of close to the hyperplane boundaries. In our approach, what we proposed is a new noise tolerant model of human learners, which is essentially inspired from this noise free, noise free setting, but it kind of generalizes this in order to increase robustness. Then we designed this teaching algorithm strict, which selects a sequence of examples to show to learners in order to steer them towards target hypothesis. This algorithm has some nice approxima approximation guarantees, but without going into the details of this algorithm, let me show some experimental results of how well it performs in real world setting. So this is um, a user study with 520 participants from a crowdsourcing platform where the task is to teach them to identify whether an image contains endangered woodpecker or not. That's the only binary question that they know. So these participants are divided into different control groups depending on the teaching algorithm and the length of teaching. After teaching is finished, participants see 15 new or unseen examples and their accuracy or performance is measured on this uh, test phase. So what you see in this plot is three different teaching algorithms and on the x-axis is the length of teaching. Y-axis is the error on this test phase. So random is a simple benchmark which simply picks examples randomly. Classical approach is the one that I mentioned earlier. It performs even worse than random because it tends to pick examples which are actually confusing or difficult for human learners. And strict policy is able to achieve much faster reduction in error and up to 20% lower error rate compared to these two baselines. And going beyond image annotation task, there are of course a lot of applicability of this kind of personalized teaching policies towards data-driven and online education. So we have seen large number of online platforms coming up in the last few years, and there has been an exponential growth in the number of students taking online courses. The big challenge faced by these platforms is high dropout. I'm particularly interested in the algorithmic questions of human learning and teaching. And one important step towards this goal is to develop data-driven models of human learning process, especially for more complex learning tasks. Then I'm interested in developing personalized or adaptive teaching policies that could maximize engagement. There are, of course, a lot of challenges in developing this kind of intelligent teaching algorithm because students have different competence, learning rate, and prior skills to which teaching algorithm must be adapted. I'm also interested in questions of collaborative learning or finding peers in social networks so we could learn together. And I'll be very happy to discuss this details in um, these ideas and details in more detail later on. Next, let me tell you briefly about the research theme of sensing. And this theme has been inspired from tackling the air pollution in cities. Specifically, I've been working as part of a, a Swiss nationwide project, OpenSense, in collaboration with different universities and healthcare institutes. And one important step towards tackling air pollution is to build air pollution maps which are of high spatial and temporal resolution. What you see in this picture is 20 national stations in Switzerland. These stations produce very high quality data. However, these are very expensive sensors and hence the data is extremely sparse. As part of this project, 
Yes, cheaper sensors have been deployed on trams and buses in uh, public transport in Zurich and Lausanne. This is a good step forward. However, the data is still limited to only these cities and only along public transportation tracks. What I've been developing as looking in as part of this is looking at new sensing modalities that you could incorporate into daily lives of people. What you see on the top left is a small pocket size sensor, costs about $300, and you could easily put in your pocket or install on your bike. And I have developed this smartphone application that allows users to put this sensor on your bike and transmit data in real time to the backend server. That's about the sensing modalities. Now, let's say you, we have a lot of people carrying around these sensors. What you would like to do is select a subset of users, collect their data, apply machine learning algorithms, and build these maps. However, when these sensors are held by people, it leads to new algorithmic challenges. So what I have been doing as part of my research is developing new algorithms for submodular optimization for sensor selection that could deal with challenges arising from human participation. One of the challenge is privacy concerns among users. And I have developed new randomized algorithm that kind of enforces a new notion of privacy or fairness that avoids targeted or greedy selection of users. Another big challenge is heterogeneity of sensors or their unknown accuracies. So you would like to learn these accuracies over time while at the same time maximize the utility of collected data. And of course, these questions of Privacy, fairness, incentives also arise in number of other applications during data collection process. One application domain where these questions become extremely critical is that of healthcare. I'm specifically interested in developing new frameworks for machine learning and data science where you could enforce privacy or fairness as a fundamental constraint, just like we know how to enforce a constraint of budget or computational resource. I'm also interested in developing new services for healthcare providers and patients because having hands-on experience and directly interacting with end users gives you insights of real-world problems. Towards this, I've been engaged in the development of this platform, HealthSol, that allows hospitals to engage with patients to receive reviews, provide feedback, and improve their healthcare services. So that covers the ideas and results on these three themes of engaging, teaching, and sensing. In summary, my research is focused on developing technology to tackle real world problems and have a positive impact on society. And I believe to achieve this goal, it is important to develop new techniques that works in coherence with end users and engage and empower people. My general approach to research is to take inspiration from real world problems, then develop algorithms that are theoretically well-founded with provable guarantees, and then applying them back in real world setting by deploying and developing new services. The research questions that I have looked so far in my research have been inspired from the application domains of smart mobility, sharing economy marketplaces, citizen science, and community sensing applications. And there are a lot of open research questions in these domains that I continue to explore. And two other application domains that I'm most excited about to expand my research horizons are online education and healthcare. And a lot of this research is very interdisciplinary, and I believe there are a lot of opportunities to collaborate and work together. With this, I reached the end of my talk, and I would like to thank all my collaborators at ETH Zurich and beyond, with whom I've been working in the last five years. I would also like to thank my organizers and industrial partners in organization of CrowdML series of workshops in the last three years. And importantly, thank you, everyone, for inviting me here and for listening to the talk. Thank you. Time for a few questions. It seems like there's settings where you could have much more adversarial participants. The competing bike share wants to drain your budget and this sort of thing. Have you thought about those sort of challenges? Yeah, so definitely. So, I mean, some of the, at least the theoretical guarantees are definitely based on assumption that uh, you are interacting with users one by one. So there is no one user who could actually reason about uh, rejecting a lot of offers in hope that I could accept offer in the future. So a lot of theoretical guarantees would definitely break down in those settings. When we deployed this system in the real world setting, we had to kind of tune to a lot of these constraints. So one simple challenge was really users could pick up the bike and put it back at the same station. So we had to actually put a 30 minutes delay that when user pick up a bike from some station, within 30 minutes they cannot put it back at the same station, for example. So 
when we try to put these systems in real world setting, a lot of interesting challenges come in, and both experimentally, both theoretically, and I think there's a lot of space to explore these ideas. Um, in terms of implementing these sorts of things in practice, my understanding that in systems like City Bike, they tend to do like yearly memberships and don't want to change the structure. So, what sort of avenues are there for incentives within this structure if you can't do pricing or money back? Definitely. So, the question is so, a lot of these uh, bike sharing systems are basically based on yearly membership. You know, so there's kind of it's not like a car sharing service where you could actually quickly do some kind of dynamic pricing. Is that the right way to? Yeah, so actually, so one key difference here in bike sharing system is that we are not doing any kind of dynamic pricing because the bikes are actually free for 30 minutes. So what we are offering is some kind of incentives which are a positive incentive. So they actually users only receive money whenever they accept our offer. So in a car sharing service, the, the one we have been uh, working on, you, have, you could actually do more things. You could actually do dynamic pricing, which is a very common thing being used in current services. So here is actually just a positive incentive. So that's the key difference uh, in, in the system that I discussed so far. Do you have any sense how uh, comparing incentives would work with just providing people information in the sense that if you tell me where there are bikes, <laughs> that will be incenting me to go to the right place instead? Yes, so I, I, I think uh, some of the challenges could be resolved by just kind of right recommendation. So the incentives are more effective where right recommendation is not still not useful for the user. So here, basically, user is going to station I. Station I does have a bike for user to pick up. So in a, in a way, this is a right recommendation here. So what we are asking is user to pick up a bike from station J, which is completely full. However, what you're saying is maybe the station I is empty, then you, we should ask user to anyway switch to J. So I think it's a mix of right recommendations and really making users switch decisions which are not optimal for them. Is, is that answer yeah. uh, This is a more of an uh, economics uh, question, uh, maybe empirical economics. So, like in, in these uh, um, uh, Airbnb studies, you know, if you kind of believed in the free market, then why would this be a problem? Like presumably, uh, there, there's a cost for uncertainty if a new person comes in, and the new people should realize this and discount their price. Like if you're a company, you have new products, like you'll try to undercut mm -hmm. the competition. And you know, what's the line of thought for why people aren't uh, doing that? Yeah, so the, the, that's kind of the current solution that hosts themselves are kind of lowering the price. In fact, there is a new startup, AirDNA, which actually just provides this service. It could, it could tell hosts, you know, essentially how you are competing with other hosts and what should be the right price. So what the, the viewpoint that we are thinking about is maybe it's the marketplace Airbnb that should provide this discount themselves and hosts don't have to reason about what is the right uh, price to kind of uh, increase or decrease. So our thinking has been more of Airbnb as a marketplace itself has incentive to kind of bring more hosts into the marketplace. So they could actually provide this discount coupons themselves on behalf of hosts and let host not reason about what is the right price and host could still keep the same price as other, other hosts. So that has been our thinking, but what you're saying is also right in a sense that that's what is happening right now, that hosts themselves kind of try to dynamically change the price. <laughs> so I had a question about the optimal teaching, um, and I wasn't quite, un I didn't understand how you were picking the examples, so what, you must know something about the examples and the differences. Yeah. Where did that information come from? What attributes are you using? Definitely. So yeah, so there's a um, lot of details that I, I didn't really describe. So basically, a lot of this, uh, this classical approach and our approach, both of these results are based on the assumption that you do have a hypothesis space and feature space of the learner. So this both, everything that I just mentioned in terms of teaching dimension and our teaching algorithm starts from there. So now that's a big question, how would you get that hypothesis space or uh, feature space? So the, what, what I did in this particular experiment of endangered woodpecker, the way we got those features was, so we took binary annotations for any image, we took some binary features. 
So the feature would be, is the peak color red or not? Is the build length uh, short or long? So this gives you kind of uh, binary features through which you could actually construct some feature space. And then we construct, create an X star or optimal hypothesis in that feature space. This is just an assumption. So what we do is we assume maybe this is a feature space and hypothesis space that learner is thinking. And then we just use that to find the optimal examples. But there's a lot of interesting research questions here now. What can you achieve when there's a mismatch of feature space that teacher is thinking and what learner actually has? So that we haven't explored at all in terms of theoretical guarantees here. But there's a lot of interesting questions in this space, definitely. So in the context, you mentioned the question of how we would actually maybe even locate new um, uh, new stations or things like that. How would it differ from uh, you know would, would it from things like standard facility location optimization methods? I mean uh, that have been considered in in other work on bike share systems. Yeah, so it, it kind of kind of maps to that. So, so the way we have been thinking of is um, some kind of a structural prediction. You know, so you want to essentially so there are two things going on. One is you want to learn how what stations are useful based on what stations have been allocated in other cities. So you have the geolocation feature, you have the stations as a ground truth. And then there is some kind of a, um, there's a structure here in a sense that you don't want to have two stations located at the same location. So what we have been doing is some kind of learning a function which kind of output a subset of stations which have, has this kind of a structural constraints enforced into that. But this is a common problem in a lot of other application domains, I believe. So this is, I think, something that you could uh, apply it in other application domains or leverage the information from other sources into, into back in here. So one key, I think, interesting direction that we kind of uh, have been looking recently is where there are not stations, but the question is to decide how to expand the areas. That gets more tricky because there are no stations anywhere. So the question is what kind of uh, geolocation uh, how, so it's called geofence in this space. How should I expand my geofence? There it gets much more tricky where we don't know exactly how to use some of the standard algorithms. So, so this is a lot of work in progress, the, the, the last point of long-term planning. But I think learning and um, predicting optimal geofences, which are not stations, but some kind of periphery of the cities is very interesting. Um, I think we're out of time, so let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Mm -hmm.